Hello, my name is Ethan Price, and I will be discussing how psychology plays a role in both the criminal justice system as well as in the courts. So first, I will be discussing three different sections of this assignment, which will be about the case of Jared Loebner, about who is affected by the by mental illness within the criminal justice system, and talk about how programs have been implemented in order to help the criminal justice system and the courts better understand and help these individuals who are affected by mental illness. So first, I will be talking briefly about uh, Jared Loebner. So Jared Loebner was just a, an average uh, American citizen who one day decided to walk into a grocery store and open fire upon 19 individuals, uh, killing six of them and 13 of them being injured. So we initially, we weren't exactly sure what had happened to Jared, why he started doing this. So he was arrested for his actions. And from there, he was tested for his competence. So the court ordered a competence, competence test. A psychologist tested him and found that he was competent but rather that it was something else that caused this whole debacle. So what happened was that he more than likely did all this because he's diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was diagnosed after the court hearing, not before. So prior to his actions, he had no idea uh, that he was schizophrenic until after um, the diagnosis by the psychologist. So why is his case different or more interesting? So his case is interesting in that when the court found out that he was schizophrenic, they ordered him to have medication, but Jared decided that he didn't want to take the medication. So then it was tested of whether or not he was a harm to himself or harm to others. Because if he wasn't harmed, then it would be okay for him to have to choose not to take the medicine. Um, so he refuted taking the medicine, and thus it was pled to the court of whether or not he's able to choose to not take the medication. Unfortunately, the court found that he was not uh, competent, not necessarily competent, but he it would be better for him to take the medication because of his previous actions and because he could be a harm to himself and to others based on this psychoanalysis. So his plea was refuted and then he was forced to take the medication. He was forced to take the medication voluntarily. He then asked the court, hey, can we try to get this settled? So the court finally heard him and decided to take it to court where he then gave a very compelling reason why he shouldn't be on the medication. And that was that he could uh, give up his right to a fair trial. Because as the defendant, he by saying that he's taking medication and that he's on medication, he could be deemed less likely to um, not necessarily walk free, but have a lesser punishment because he's on this medication to keep him under control, in a sense. Um, so this kind of leads into the next topic of how does the court, who in the court system and the criminal justice system uh, is affected by mental illness. So I'm gonna be more so specifically talking about the criminal justice system in this case. So in an article done by Jennifer Bronson and Marcus Berzowski, Berzowski, it's a really weird last name. They did an article about, uh, a research article about the federal and state level prisoners and about jail inmates. And they did an article discussing who in those systems, respectively, are affected by mental illness and also who's not. So they found that about one in seven prisoners, about 14% uh, at both the state and federal level, and then one in every four jail inmates, about 26%, uh, 
uh, have reported to have serious psychological distress or SPD within the last 30 days before the survey was conducted uh, between 2011 and 2012. Um, so serious psychological psychological stress that could range from anything of um, you know multiple beatings or perhaps they were verbally abused several times uh, while in the court system within the last 30 days of the survey. Um, you know, it could even be self-harm. So another question is like, why do these occurrences happen? And why would these inmates have these SPDs? Well, it could range from anywhere from other inmates making fun of them uh, for having psychological issues, or it could be from also themselves, like I said earlier, it could be self-harm, uh, whether it's, you know, verbal abuse to themselves or if they're self-harming, that could also be a, an issue. Um, another part of the research was how many of these individuals within these systems uh, were previously told that they had some kind of mental disorder. They found that about 37% of the prisoners at the state and federal level and about 44% of the jail inmates had been told that they had some kind of mental disorder. Um, it was interesting to read about some of the commonality disorders that were found between the jail inmates and the prison inmates. So some of the common diagnoses or diagnosi were bipolar disorder, some sort of depressive disorder, whether it be major or minor, uh, a form of anxiety disorder, and then some form of PTSD. So we could go into a whole other topic of what causes these issues, but more than likely it's because of their upbringing. So many criminals and many inmates, many prisoners, tend to have a very common upbringing, whether it's it was just part of their day-to-day -day life of they had to steal in order to make do, they had to do this and that in order to make sure that maybe their family member or maybe their, you know, like their wife or their daughter didn't go without food that day. Um, or if maybe they were raised in a gang and maybe their father was a part of it and then they were brought up into that gang. Um, these kinds of backgrounds are very common within criminals. And I've even learned in other classes of it's even on the genetic level potentially for um, criminals to be found within our day to day society. Again, I won't be going into that here. But then, but now I will be talking about the last section, which is um, about programs that have been implemented to help these individuals. So prior to these programs, oftentimes, uh, sorry, oftentimes what these uh, socially disturbed or mentally, excuse me, mentally disturbed individuals uh, would be treated, they would be treated very plainly. Um, Police officers didn't really have a way to deal with these individuals effectively. So one of their solutions really was just to lock them up, find them, lock them up, and go from there. Now there's a much more complex system, not really complex, but a much more thorough system of dealing with these individuals. So Right now, there is a form of training that was discussed in the article by Arthur J. Lurgio and James A. Swartz, who talk about uh, the history of criminality, crimi criminology, sorry, um, as far as policing goes, and how it has improved over the years thanks to these programs and how they've been able to do deal with these PSMIs, which I know I'm kind of fighting this, uh, PSMIs are persons with serious mental illness. 
So they were taught, they are now taught how to deal with these PSMIs by first talking through, talking to them, you know, trying to figure out what exactly is happening. This not only provides a more social relationship between the officer and the individual that is mentally disturbed uh, or has a mental illness, but it helps create a better light for the society around officers as well. So from here, uh, officers also can develop programs to talk with correctional facilities, psychiatric facilities, that they can take these individuals, individuals to, to be psychoanal psychoanalytically analyzed. Sorry. Um, with a program like this, they can then be able to process what exactly it is that this individual is suffering from. Um, maybe that day they forgot to take their medication because oftentimes that is what happens to certain individuals that they simply forget to take their medication and they have some kind of outbreak. They have, or not, sorry, not outbreak, but outburst, uh, which leads to many issues within the societal norms. So these issues, these PSMIs have been brought to correctional facilities for better processing rather than just locking them up in a jail cell and hope for the best, right? So that is my presentation, though it was brief. I hope that the information I gave you was informative and I hope that I was um, well received as far as the information goes as well. Thank you for listening.